on uh, Thursday, April 20th. This is the um, regular meeting of the Town Council's Finance Committee. The purpose of today's meeting is to review departmental budgets as part of the overall budget for the town. On the agenda, there are three, um, actually there will be uh, five items um, in, in three segments. Um, there is an adjustment, and I'll, um, we'll explain that in a second. Um, but the first um, uh, budget that we'll be looking at is finance and assessing. Then we'll be looking at SEDCO and the adjustment to the agenda is that we'll also be adding the planning department to that since uh, Karen Martin, the uh, president or uh, director, I can't remember the title, director of SEDCO is also our interim planning director. Empress. Empress, that's right, I forgot, sorry. Um, she's also our current interim uh, planning director and then we'll uh, take up public works. Um, with that, I did want to mention just for the record, uh, for as far as a call to order in those presence is that uh, Chairman uh, Peter Hayes is um, at a previous engagement and could not make it this evening. So uh, both Chris and I will be balancing responsibilities and running the meeting, but I think it will go fairly smoothly. Um, he does, um, he will be here and uh, we'll catch up uh, regarding our conversations today. So um, but with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tom and um, our finance director, Ruth, uh, to begin the process. Great. Great. So Ruth? Oh, I'm sorry, I always forget this. Item number three is approval of the minutes for April 13th, 2017. Is there a motion? Move, move approved as written. And I'll second that. No adjustments. Uh, all in favor? And that's two to zero. Thank you. Sorry, keep the answer. Yeah, that's, you know, that's why you gave me the gavel, I guess, right? <laughs> Tell me what to do. Um, with that, now Tom and Ruth, I can turn it over to you guys. Great. Uh, so Ruth obviously is here uh, to assist you generally, but also to uh, speak to the finance department. Um, I'll be collaborating on the assessing component there. I might suggest um, with finance we start with the revenue portion. Um, Chapter 3, page 2. Pages finance related mm -hmm. revenues. Tab two. No, tab three, page two. Oh, just tab two, page two. No, tab three, three. page two. I'll shut up. <laughs> so good evening. Trying to help you, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I appreciate that. I'm the one fumbling around. Sorry. Oh, <clears throat> excuse me. The, um, the revenues for the finance department have increased over last year by about 200 and almost 216,000. The bulk of that has to do with the excise revenues. Uh, as with other communities, we've seen a surge in the purchase of new vehicles and that has allowed us to benefit from that through the excise tax. A couple of items of note regarding excise is that there have been a number of bills, is that what they're called, at the state level where they're trying to reduce the amount of revenue to receive. So far, most of those have gone through with ought not to pass, which is uh, good for the town because we get to retain those revenues. There are still a couple out there. Uh, one has to do with veterans who are disabled, and um, that one I think is still in the works. There's another one with the Transportation Committee that is trying to take the excise of our major trucks, and I think that is going to be discussed tomorrow at their regular transportation meeting for the budget. So we're not out of the woods yet with regards to that. But so the long and short of that statement is that the state's looking to take more money away from the community. That's correct. <laughs> In spite of that, we have increased the projection by uh, two hundred thousand dollars this year, and I would direct your attention to the projection. Uh, this is an area that you may want to revisit before you conclude your deliberations. Uh, there potentially is more money there, uh, as much as another 200000 Is there, um, I, I couldn't find it in the beginning, is there a trend uh, chart that shows excise over time as a total dollar? I know that we've, we've tinkered with that a couple of times and kind of been a very aggressive and that's one that you always have to be careful of because in a downturn economy, it's the first thing that will go down. I, I did take a look. I don't think it's here, but uh, during the recession, each year we were reducing our estimated revenue because in the prior year we weren't receiving what we estimated. That trend has turned, 
whether or not it will continue in that way uh, remains to be seen. I, I do think this projection, I, I looked at it again this morning and, and we probably could tweak it up even a little bit higher than what it is. So uh, as long as the state doesn't play with the, the excise yeah. formula or anything, I think we this is an area we can we can check mm. we can up. We can provide that summary analysis has one, but it simply reports uh, excise and other taxes as a percentage of total revenue. So that really doesn't isolate a revenue. Right. But we can certainly provide that. That would be helpful. Mm -hmm. We can provide that. Yeah. I'm just curious. Yeah. I'm, I don't recall us ever not meeting our excise revenue projection. No. There's been a couple, a couple of tight calls. Tight calls. Mm -hmm. But we've always been fairly aggressive right. year over year, kind of that, uh, increasing it. But we've always met it. Yeah. Um, I'm just always anxious to not rely on that too much because it is right. volatile. It's not necessarily very stable. I mean, if it comes in, that's great. But I don't want to start making that a basis for continuing continuing to rely on it. You know, but, I mean, if it's a short term. Well, that new fund balance policy it also helps support the fund balance in the sense that that goes directly into that fund balance. Right. Well, it's, not, it's not budgeted to be used. Given some of the challenges we still face in this budget, right. uh, this may be an area you yep. want to go back to, though. Yep. So I think that's probably all in revenue. Well, right? I, I did want to ask because there was one uh, significant change that's obviously much significantly lower, but I believe I, I can't, the color on this is really not that great, by the way. Is it investment interest? When I look at the right line, it's a $14,000 increase. Mm -hmm. uh, with the change in uh, the interest rate with the Federal Reserve upping the, the rate uh, that tends to benefit us because we now uh, are seeing higher interest rates, <laughs> better interest exactly. rates than, than yeah. what they have been. Okay. So that has helped. We've also changed a little bit in how we're doing some of our investments. We have a couple of investment firms that are uh, a little bit more aggressive in terms of the investments that we're using. I mean, most of it is still in CDs, but we're, we're, we have our portfolio, we've lettered it out, so we're uh, earning higher rates for the longer term. So help me understand a little bit, Ruth, what, what, are, those, what are those investments, uh, what are they for, or is it just a reserve, kind of like a reserve fund for us, or what's the purpose of having those investments? We have um, some funds, like our cemetery funds, those mm -hmm. are at scholarship money. Um, if we have any bond proceeds, those are earning interest. We have uh, quite a few special revenue funds for uh, the revenues that we earn, uh, are, that we collect on those are for specific purposes. Uh, if those funds aren't necessarily needed at this point in time, such as some of the impact fees. We build those funds up for a point in time when we need to use them. Uh, in the meantime, they stay in an investment account and they earn interest. Um, these are specific to just the general fund. So, you know, after taxes come in, we have some funds available before we pay our debt and, and uh, we invest in the funds. Thanks. Uh, if there's no other questions on that, then we can go to tab four, page 19. Page, yes. And on the expenditure side, I, I'm happy to answer any questions. Our total budget, if we exclude assessing for the minute, the finance and revenue budget it has shows a 2.1 percent increase overall, and uh, the bulk of that has to do with the full-time employees who retired, and we replaced that employee with two part-time people, and so pretty much we saved on uh, the full-time benefit costs. There are some lines that show like really big percentages. But most of those are like this one that shows a 20% increase. It's a $1,400 increase, but it has to do with the registry of deeds when we uh, file our liens or we release liens. Uh, there's a cost to all of those. We're, I'm sorry, where are you? We're in the uh, narrative part, I think. 
Oh. But are you on a schedule that's in a different tab? Oh. No, I'm just talking in general about contract services. Oh, 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 oh. oh okay. okay. I mean, there's line item detail. I think there's line item is. detail oh, in the back of the but, book. That's pretty right. much what I am okay. Okay. referring to. But essentially, um, for the most part, we haven't seen much change. We have an 80% increase in our property line. However, we're looking to uh, which turns into a $1,000 increase. We're doing some ergonomic. We're looking at some ergonomic uh, changes for some of our staff. I mean, the big thing is benefit from wages. Yep. And the net result is $70,000 increase, and you said that was because of reallocation of resources to increase positions? Uh, to taking one full, well, the largest increase has to do, like I said, the 2% has to do with the accounting and the revenue office. The major increases have to do with the assessor's office because we are going from, we're trying to go from a contracted service to a full-time position, which includes benefits. And assessing is by itself right. is approximately yes. a 30% increase. Yes. So Tom, um, mm -hmm. how does uh, your announcement last night regarding uh, the situation with the replacement for the assessor going through the contracted services Obviously, you didn't know what you, we needed to do then. Is, is this, is this uh, sufficient in the budget to cover? I believe we have adequate resources. That effectively, I would pay uh, you know, this contracted service uh, from the full-time lines until that contract runs out, uh, and then there will be existing resources to hire a full-time assessor for the balance of the year. So I think there's adequate resources here to cover both. Okay. And we've made adjustments to the benefit lines to adjust for a, a later hire. And just to mention, because we do get different viewers in different meetings, last night the manager advised the council that um, they are looking at a contract of service agreement with, um, I don't remember the names of the party, but uh, two people. David and Elizabeth Sawyer. Right, two, um, one from South Portland, retired, one from South Portland, and one from Wyndham. Retired. Wyndham. So uh, we're looking at contracting services rather than immediately going into a full hire since there's a kind of a gap in what's available out there. Yeah, Council Chair Bevine was kind enough to sit through interviews and I think can attest to the fact that uh, there really wasn't uh, a viable candidate in the first round and I think it's best to get through commitment um, and then go back at it in the, in the fall when things kind of settle down in the assessing world and hope for better success.
Thank you very much. And next we'll be moving into um, Ms. Empress Martin's um, world of SEDCO and our planning department. And I have a tie that matches that dress, by the way. And a pocket cloth. <laughs> Go to sophisticatedgentleman.com and then you get it for 20 bucks. Okay. Uh, huh. Don't know where to go with that. <laughs> <laughs> Better just to let it lay anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> People are learning sometimes just let me speak and don't yeah. slide right off the edge. Well, um, thank you for uh, letting me appear um, today to talk about both planning and SEDCO. I really appreciate that. Um, if we can maybe go alphabetical today, we'll do planning first, and I'm going to let Tom tell us, tab whatever and which page. Oh, sure. <laughs> Wait for a loop. When you <laughs> Sorry about that. We start at the revenue, which is tab three, page two. There you go. Awesome. Sorry, page three. There's really only one question. The revenue is fairly flat, but there, there is one jump, which is the building permits. That's pretty significant. Yeah. Oh, you want to do revenue? Uh, just that one item, I think, is right. the so, only one. That, I mean, that's the only substantive one. Sure, sure. The revenue, uh, in terms of revenues, the reason there's that jump is they anticipated revenues from some of the multifamily development that is coming online, and I'll talk about that on the expense side as well. Uh, but that really is, in a nutshell, um, what that that jump in revenues will be. So is this from the increase in the reserve pool that we that we approved, or because we're we're capped out every year with building permits, so that right? The those increase in the fees is really about the um, building inspections okay. uh, that are anticipated. It didn't okay. stop you and correct you for anything, so I'm going to keep. I was looking at you. So okay, yeah. great. Yeah, well, well, one of the things I did want to start out by saying um, thank you to the planning and code enforcement staff. You know, they've just been so great that for the last week and a half. Um, you know, their expertise, their sense of understanding what they need to do, um, and really a great sense of humor. So I just have to say thank you to them, and they've helped me cram a bit for being able to present the planning budget. Um, so let's start from the top. Um, we talked about expenses. At this point, we're uh, a little over a million, $1.039 million for fiscal year 2018, talking about a 9% increase, which is about $86,000. The 84% of that number is really due to wages and benefits. Just under half of the increase that we're talking about overall, um, which is about $40,000, somewhere in there, that is going to be used to uh, really uh, hire a part-time code enforcement officer, um, and that really is to help us through the crunch of when that multifamily comes, in, comes online. And so the, the concept is that the revenues from the fees are going to cover um, that part-time code enforcement officer. Um, and it really will be um, great to have that extra uh, capacity. You know, summer is particularly uh, busy for the code enforcement folks, um, and this person will really relieve some of the pressure, uh, particularly on the commercial code enforcement officer, to be able to do that. And um, it, one of the things we certainly have talked about um, in-house is that, um, you know, that may be a part-time person. It also may be a, a contracted service. It really just depends on when these other projects are coming online because we want to time it with that. Um, and uh, there's also certainly a, a shortage of people, you know, probably in code enforcement and in the construction industry. So we, we may need to be a little flexible on whether or not that's a contracted from a service perspective or we can actually find a part-time person. So, so oh, sorry, if I could, oh, yeah. what's the impact if, if that person doesn't come online? Is it, is it just longer inspection, longer waits for inspection? Yes, it'll be longer time? waits for inspection, um, and, and time is money with respect to the inspection, um, you know, uh, folks, when they're ready for inspection, they really want to see people out there within the next few days. And our code enforcement officer, our commercial code enforcement officer in particular, He's really tightly booked. Um, he is 
he's at capacity. Uh, so I really think that uh, from a staffing perspective and from a service delivery perspective to um, uh, the folks who need the, the inspections, I don't see how we can go, go around not having a, um, some assistance. Can, can you, can you, and I don't necessarily need it right now, but mm -hmm. um, could we get some feedback on what kind of delays we might be talking about if we don't bring that person in? Are we talking weeks, months? Okay. You know, just, just ballpark. I sure. Don't anything specific. Okay. I don't think I'm prepared to answer that, so no, I will get that. Sure. 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 Absolutely. Um, and again, you know, the idea is the fees definitely offset um, the cost of the new service or the additional help for delivering the service. Um, what you also see in terms of, of the increase is the sustainable, the, we pay for a third of the sustainability coordinator um, who has done some wonderful work this year and has really helped us with, um, you know, some of the uh, um, watershed planning work. So we're very pleased and very excited about that. And again, we pay for a third of that position in our budget. Um, other expenses, we've really tried to keep to um, really a level, a level funding. Um, and I can take you through both planning and code enforcement. Um, if you like um, the planning highlights, it's really, um, you know, the, the increases are due to um, the staffing, um, the three or four percent increase in, um, you know, both uh, reflecting the cost of living and the health care costs that, that go with the, the employment. The 19,300, that's at the third of our sustainability, not the, the third of the cost of the sustainability coordinator. We're not dividing her in three. Um, you know, we have a little minor increase in supplies. Um, that's just reflecting, you know, the needs of a busy office. And so overall planning and engineering is a 7.4% uh, increase, again, mostly due to staffing. Uh, existing staffing. Um, code enforcement, really uh, level service, if you will, except for the, um, the addition of the code enforcement officer. And then I just, I can't stop myself from wanting to, you know, just touch on a few highlights because I just think the work of the Planning and Codes Department is so important and they've done such great job uh, every year, but you know, um, there are some really important things on the agenda for next year. Certainly the comp plan, which we'll talk about when we talk about the CIP. Um, we're also looking at, as part of that, really um, purchasing a module for our GIS program that will really do software modeling for community impact analysis. And it's our answer to the growth and services study that was done 10 or 15 years ago. This new modeling technique, number one, once it's built, um, and that's what we would be expending some money for that. Once it's built, it is an ongoing model that we can look at um, and build for the future. And I just think that's critically important as we look at both um, doing more impact analysis um, for projects but also, you know, really tracking uh, trends in development, how the pattern affects the cost of development, and this module will help us do that. Um, so that really is part and parcel with the comprehensive plan, but I just did want to highlight that because that's actually an ongoing, workable model that we can use um, from then on. Uh, so I'm just, the data person in me is very excited about that. Um, you know, there are a couple of others, they seem small, but I think there'll be a really big impact for our customers. One is really a reorganization of the zoning ordinance to make it a little more readable. As you know, it's about 400 pages and sometimes it's hard to find everything. Um, so really um, doing some of that work, I think will really make a big difference for our customers. Um, we do need to do a little bit of an update on the shoreland zoning. Um, the state has come up with some additional, um, not criteria, but some revisions to the shoreland zoning, and that will need to be done uh, this coming year. And some of the changes, I haven't looked at them all, but some of the changes I think are going to be really um, great for the administration of the ordinance and for the ease and understanding of what's going on there. 
Karen, um, can you yeah. comment too? We got FEMA map updates. That's, That's going to make an impact as well. Absolutely. So, yeah. Next on a, next on the list is um, you know really continuing the work of uh, analyzing the, the FEMA maps. They've just come in. I think Jay Chase here has been doing a lot of that coordination for the work. Um, so. We are in the process of receiving them. I guess we just got them this week. This week? Yes, yes this week. Uh, and uh, there's been a lot of investment in looking at the previous iterations of them. And so we're trying to figure out um, what's been revised and how that will um, affect um, our, um, uh, our, our acceptance of the maps as they are. So our understanding from talking to Jay, um, is that um, we think the time, the time period, or the window for you know making any appeals, is will start in July, and I believe it's a 90-day appeal period. And I don't know, Tom, if you've got. Yeah, and, and in that regard, um, I'm wondering what the uh, reduction that we're proposing under boards and committees is on page 37, uh, contract and services. The bulk of that number is something we call planning initiatives, and it's uh, historically gone to fund all sorts of small little mm -hmm. kind of consultant and engineering projects in support of all the kind of committee work, long range mm -hmm. planning, transportation committee conservation, and I would put the theme of flood maps kind of in that category. I'm wondering out loud a bit to you as to whether or not we should perhaps put that back to where it was last year, maybe a, another $5,000 back to where it was in the, in the current year just to make sure that we have some monies to continue with our consultants and see that through appeal. Uh, there potentially are, are massive impacts on hundreds of properties in town depending on um, these FEMA flood maps. And uh, the appeals are complicated. It actually requires the development of a unique model given the unique geography of our MARS system. Uh, it doesn't work well with the models that FEMA is using up and down the East Coast, frankly. Uh, we've made, as Karen's mentioned, uh, a fairly significant investment in that regard, and it would be a shame not to kind of maximize that. And we can't expect individual homeowners to necessarily be in a position to fund that or appeal those on a property by property basis. So that's been the thinking. Uh, we've been in a holding pattern for, well, since 2013, frankly. Uh, but it sounds like this will be the year where we're going to have to really exert ourselves. The long way of saying is, I, I'm thinking that we may want to beef that up slightly to make sure that we have the funding to engage the consultants and see it through. So my question is, is $5,500 going to be enough for the full appeal and what's that process look like? I mean, are we talking legal or are we talking just more technical engineering? It's technical engineering. Uh, it could ultimately become legal, but uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a process that's really technical. It's engineers, talk to engineers, if you will, with the, there's a whole separate panel of technical experts that analyze uh, the merits of the appeal and such. Um, I think the answer is we, we don't know yet. Yeah. Um, right now our consultant is uh, going through the maps and really comparing uh, this current draft of maps to the prior draft so we can assess uh, how they've changed, if at all. Uh, if they haven't changed much, uh, we clearly have hundreds of properties that will be severely negatively affected and, and I would be recommending that we do move forward with the appeal. The unknown is whether we have sufficient resources to see that through at the end. So I, this is new information since the book was put together. So uh, my initial response is um, one for such a small dollar amount, I would rather, uh, rather than reacting impulsively today, even though it is so small, is to wait until we always have this reconciliation process at mm -hmm. the end after we talk about policy directions as far as, you know, that apply across the board. And, you feel at that time that that should be increased and mm -hmm. offset by other activities, then I think that's part of that conversation mm -hmm. and really us making that determination right now. Good. We just wanted to touch on it while it was okay. in front of you. Okay. I'll bring it back if, if necessary. And by then we will have had, uh, I think, an initial mm -hmm. consult back from our consultant in terms of uh, how they look, what the level of effort might be required. Okay. <coughs> And then, if there are any questions, we could talk about the two items in the CIP. Yep. I'm sorry. Um, so, uh, although I didn't, um, I know that there's something in the CIP regarding a reconfiguration of the, uh, the area for planning. Is that correct? 
Uh, not mm -hmm. for next year. Oh, okay. I'm taking out. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, there's chagrin. It was uh, taken out. We started the competition around that last year, which was, I believe, taken out last year as well. So it was, and just for the, what that was, I think there was a recommendation to reconfigure the layout of the planning department and the customer areas, um, or citizen area when they come in because it's a very tight combination. So it's a very inefficient layout, both in the offices and the, the front end. So. But there are two uh, capital yes. uh, equipment requests. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, one, and then two capital project requests. The equipment can be found on tab six, page seven. Okay. And what you see is um, we do have one of our, uh, the, the, we have two leafs, and one of them is coming up for. Um, you should the, define what a leaf is. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a big, no. Um, it's one of our electric cars. And one of those is coming up for lease at the end of July. And so we've, we've uh, targeted about $12,000 to um, hopefully buy out the, the leaf at the end of its lease. Um, we are waiting for some numbers from um, the dealership to tell us what that would be. Um, but we would need to replace that, uh, that, that vehicle. So I have to apologize. I'm looking at behind tab seven, and I'm on. It's not page two. Talks about um, capital projects that has two projects for 105,000. That's not including the vehicle. What, where is the state? And then I go to the written narrative, and I don't see any vehicle mentioned. I, I beg your pardon. I thought I said tab. I meant to say tab six, page seven. Okay. Sorry. I'm having trouble with my tabs tonight. <laughs> That's $12,500. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. what we expect the residual value would be to buy the vehicle out um, at the end of the term. Yeah, so, so um, not that I recall, but how's that experiment been? I'm it, it, just let me speak to it. It's been very good. I mean, we've never, at least during my tenure, uh, leased a vehicle. Uh, we did so because we got such an attractive deal through a CMP mm -hmm. grant. They bought down the cost of the lease. Uh, so it was it was really a no-brain financial decision that we do that. We're nearing the end of that 36-month term, as with most closed-end leases, there's a, an option to buy for a, an agreed-upon price, and 12.5, I believe, is the was the agreed-upon residual value. The vehicle has performed incredibly well. Um, as expected, it's done everything and, and then some that we've needed it to do. It, it doesn't travel really beyond the boundaries of Scarborough, but for a couple of occasions, and so it serves their needs uh, around town very, very well. Is it, if you don't buy this, um, is there any cost for not buying at the end of the lease? No, we walk away, but we're without a vehicle. Right, I just, because um, um, I remember reading something way back about electric cars having a very large um, expense when you try to get rid of them because of the, the batteries. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know if that any of that cost was transferred on to the leasee when you turn that in, if it's at its end, end of its useful life. Um, I have not seen that. You know right, yeah. I, I don't think so. In fact, I, I talked with the um, the dealership earlier this, this week, and um, they are going to give us, you know, some options, too, because we did ask, you know, we could give us the price for buying it out, but also let us know, you know, is there something that is coming online? Is there a better is there a better use of our uh, residual funds, so to speak, just in case there, um, if there's such improvement in the battery life or in uh, you know the ability of the leaf to go further? Um, we certainly would like to know that. Um, so they are going to get back to us with those with those answers. And, and what's this, what's the vehicle being used for right now? It is used. Um, by code enforcement staff when they're out in the field. Um, it's also used by staff if they're going out to, um, you know, meetings in Portland or, or wherever. It's also used occasionally by um, uh, other than planning and code enforcement staff. So it gets used there out almost all the time. And this is in lieu of a, a mileage reimbursement, let's say, for a personal vehicle or something like that. So there is, is that fair? Yeah, just, again, 
during my tenure here, we've never had that arrangement. It's always been a town-provided vehicle for okay. staff uh, to perform their, their functions. I mean, I don't want to belabor this. It's only 12500 but um, under the coding, um, A stands for appropriations, and then M is multiple sources. Or uh, what is multiple sources? I know, what is that? What does that mean in this You're appropriating the whole amount with multiple, oh, multiple sources within the appropriations. Does it say? I it says A slash M. That's first. It's the only oh. one that's in the budget that has that that I saw. Oh. And M stands for according to the key <coughs> funding from several sources. So is it just several accounts? It's not. It's not completely. Up. I mean, when you appropriate, it comes out of the it's taxes. It's, it's I don't know if that means there was supposed to be some sort of trade-in value, maybe. I'm not sure. I'll have to look okay. it up in just, the detail. Yeah. I was just curious for the code. It's not that simple. Okay. Right. So just so I'm clear, there's a couple of ones here. We've got assessing department, is the software licensing. We've got planning department, electric vehicle, and then we've got um, four capital projects. Are you going to get to that? Or are we? Okay. Then I won't, then I won't. No. But just so I'm clear, there are, there are two different lines, right? One for planning, one for assessing. I'm on, I'm on, sorry. I'm on, page, I'm on page or tab six, page two and three. We've got assessing, no, I don't, they're saying we've got, so there are, for this department, there's two, actually two. Right, we, as far as I understand, we have, we have two, two items right. um, in, you know, for next year. Right. Um, one is the comprehensive plan, and one is um, this vehicle. No, oh, no. You're, you're, you're never including assessing, which was the previous presentation. Wait, wait, wait. okay. So this is just planning. Right. Just when we, then if you go to tab seven, it's the capital projects, which okay. is the other two items that okay. Karen's talking about, which is the planning piece, the two mm -hmm. planning pieces. Yeah. Which is a total of 105,000. So that's correct. Right. So part the the first piece of that is definitely it's the um, comprehensive plan. Um, you know, we're starting it this year. We had some uh, funds um, that were appropriated last year to um, start the process, and this is the balance of um, the two-year project. So um, definitely, you know, the comprehensive plan, it is being um, uh, allocated to consulting funds. We do have a consultant on board, um, and that's part of the process that will kick off in May. I will say that I, um, I'm extremely pleased with the selection of consultant. I think uh, when you meet them, you'll share my th enthusiasm. Um, Councilor Donovan uh, participated as chair at the time, uh, or immediate past chair, uh, in those interviews, and I think he, he would concur as well. I was forced to sign a contract. I was careful to negotiate language around the contract price that I committed what was in the what is in the current budget, and. Uh, acknowledge that I needed to secure this remaining funding. So we certainly are hopeful that we're able to do that. Uh, it would make entire sense of it and keep the same consulting team start to finish. And so I, uh, we hope you find uh, out of your way to help fund that, that project to see it through. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so I, I got um, so which, um, is it the municipal campus plan or is it comprehensive planning that was divvied up between different departments and contributed, including outside agencies like the library? Which, which plan was that? Well, I proposed that about three months ago and yeah. I backtracked uh, more recently in the last uh, three weeks. I've re uh, brought that back, but in an abbreviated form. And um, I have a, a design consultant on uh, looking at just this portion of our campus, uh, basically from Town Hall, including Memorial Park, uh, that is being funded by a number of funding sources, but it's a much smaller uh, but that's not project. So that's not included in any. This of is the balance to complete the other two thirds of the campus, if you will. And I have not reached. Out, I've not pursued. This would be to fund it entirely. I've not pursued to um, source funding from others to help with the effort. I did that really because it was mid-budget year. It was not planned, and I was looking to be creative. So I, I, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm thinking. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so I'm looking at the comprehensive plan update process. Eighty thousand. It's B for bonded. Is that is that correct? So it could for be appropriated. That's, it's 
risk of 10-year life, uh, and certainly it could be appropriate. I mean, I'm not going to disagree there. So it's just an option we can look at. Absolutely. Okay. And as Tom said, the 25000 is for the Municipal Campus Master Plan. And so that's our budget request for 2018. So I think you know the the upshot is we tried or Dan certainly tried very hard to keep level funding um, and not increase the other parts of the the budget. Um, the uh, two positions are the paying for the sustain the third of the sustainability coordinator. Um, again, I think we're going to see real results from that, both from the other departments, but also from planning, um, and then the code enforcement um, assistance. So the only, I guess, the, Tom, the only comment I would share, um, and, and this kind of ties in also with the uh, um, the other uh, position that we were, were talking about, uh, particularly in assessing, is that I think that there needs to be a balance looked at um, so while I understand and appreciate the need for additional staff to support uh, where we're going, mm -hmm. uh, we also are challenged in um, this uh, plan, although you're not assessing, but planning and assessing mm -hmm. and making sure that the um, compensation for the top position is at market level because there, mm -hmm. there may need to be an adjustment made and to me that adjustment should come out of what is being budgeted in other areas. So if you need more money in order to hire, a, um, you know, a, uh, um, an assessor that is qualified, then to me, um, you would take that away from the part-time position that, you would, that you're requesting and not necessarily come back and ask for additional funding to support a uh, new hire. So we're talking about two different departments. Right. I understand that, but, okay. but from the allocation basis, it's one budget, one town, so I'm going, it's one budget across but, but departments as well. But there needs to be a balance, and it's really your job to kind of balance that. I'm just saying that I, I'm not here before you saying that I don't have adequate resources. Oh, yes. I, I, we've got I just want to make sure because, you know, part of the reason could be compensation. You know, people might not be willing to move into a new job because our compensation level might be too low. And I just think that given the circumstances, we need to look within the budget that we have. To be, if we have to beef it up, then we look within that budget and not come back and ask for more. Thank you for that. I, yeah. I'm confident that what okay. we have in there is very competitive in the market. It's just it's a, it's a shallow pool already. Oh, I Okay, I just want to make sure. So, um, bring up the sustainability coordinator. We had a couple of new positions we had last year we were going to talk about at some point, and I'll leave it to town manager's discretion of when you want to bring that, if you want to do it, you know, um, a third, a third, a third, or something, or um, just to kind of, we were going to evaluate the, the, the um, sustainability coordinator and the assistant town manager. Just to kind of give feedback to the group, because we were talking about making sure that they were viable financially, I guess, at this point, or that they were, so there was some cost savings. So I, I'd like to come back to that at some point in these discussions yep. just to see where we're at. Um, so I'll, I'll defer to your discretion or when you'd like to talk about it as a value analysis. Yeah. Added value analysis. Right. Yeah, and I, it doesn't matter to me where. It's just, just at some point to, we can look at that. Too. Very good. We're pleased to do that. I, I, I think you'll be pleased to see the sort of progress we've made, and yeah. hopefully the, you'll see the uh, improvement to the bottom line, too. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I have no question. I just, I think it's, you know, it's one thing we talked about last time I, to make sure we put it out there so that people see we are getting a good return on that investment for sure. Keep in mind those positions are really have been here for just over six months. They started yeah. in October, so uh, they're just both of them hit the ground running, but we're just now starting to see kind of the fruits yeah. of that. And uh, I think um, from what I'm hearing, um, I mean, I, I heard from uh, from people who attended. Um, EcoMain's presentation today and our sustainability coordinator did an incredible job. So just even from a reputational basis, the added value has uh, it, um, exponential given her experience and mm -hmm. contribution. So mm -hmm. I'm sure that that would only increase. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. To Check out. All right. Um, so again, I do. People out there that are watching don't know what CETCO is, that's the Discovery Economic Development Corporation. And we're on what tab four? Four. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Would you, since we're, we're actually doing well on time, can you just give a very high level overview for the public just about Segco and how it's structured? Sure. Um, mm -hmm. I think they need to understand the nonprofit status and sure. why it's independent. Right. So the Scarborough Economic Development Corporation has been in existence about 35 years at this point. Um, it was set up to uh, facilitate economic development in town, and we um, work on all levels of uh, activity with respect to economic development. Um, we do both everything from direct assistance to folks who may come in and want to stand and talk to us about either starting a business or growing their business. Um, we also um, do the marketing arm of uh, the town, so we're out there um, at trade shows or marketing events that are being coordinated by the state. Um, occasionally we have um, do travel. Uh, the last couple of years we've had a grant that helped us do a couple of other trade missions. Um, so we're definitely doing both in-state and out-of-state marketing. Some of that are, is some direct advertising um, to uh, talk to people about how wonderful it is to do business here in Scarborough. Um, but we do do some direct assistance, um, particularly if someone comes to us and they uh, need a little help understanding perhaps the planning process, but they're not quite ready to um, go to the town yet. They want to feel a little more secure about what's, what the process is. We help those folks. We will also help folks who are actually looking for um, a place to locate here in Scarborough. Um, or if they're looking for to expand and go to another another space within the within the town, so we're a full service organization with respect to um, you know promoting economic development in the town and promoting the town's image to those both inside and outside the town. The reason it was set up, um, my understanding, the reason it was set up. Um, early on as a separate corporation that was tied to the town, but separate was to provide some uh, confidentiality. There are occasions when folks are not quite ready to talk to the town. Either they're asking us to review a business plan, or they're talking about a concept, or they're talking about a location, but it's proprietary and they don't want that information out um, to anyone. So we can offer some, some uh, confidentiality with respect to some of those discussions. And that really was the concept. Uh, and I think, you know, because we are, are outside the town hall, um, we tend to have a little bit more, um, you know, business folks who will come by, drop by um, to talk about what's going on. We certainly um, encourage people to come and see us. We have resources in the office um, and we're there for uh, almost any type of service that someone needs. We're very customized in terms of um, helping folks find what they need and how to grow and expand here. Um, and we certainly do uh, we certainly do respond when there are um, either out of state or out of region or even just out of Scarborough when there's a, a large office or a large uh, company looking for space. Um, we do prepare the responses to those, so we do work with site location consultants. Um, so in a nutshell, so we're, we're, we're a full service organization with respect to economic development. Um, we also pride ourselves on being, uh, our, our putting together a broad and comprehensive data set about the town of Scarborough. And that's really, we deliver a lot of our services through our website as well. So our website walks people through the different divisions that they may encounter in the town. Um, we talk about demographics, we talk about marketing, we talk about um, neighborhoods. So we try to give people a complete uh, picture of the town and we're always working to make that website um, richer in terms of content. Um, and our website's a little more, uh, we're a little, because we're focusing on data and we're focusing in on um, um, information, we can arrange it a little more quickly, a little more um, uh, branding and marketing, in a branding and marketing context than perhaps the town can, because we're really focused on that, that business development piece. So our website is more of a business to business website. Um, 
So, yes, in a nutshell, that's perhaps too much, too big of a nut, but once you start talking, well, when you, you look at the numbers, there's not much to talk about in the numbers, so I'm glad you gave us the week the overview. <laughs> you may have Thank you. The Press Herald's, the Portland Press Herald this week, South Portland is, uh, through their budget process, mm -hmm. is looking at funding a full-time uh, position. Karen has consulted with them through the years, their economic development committee, and they're considering uh, possibly doing a, a similar model as the SEDCO. So, uh, they others are. Others are looking, for sure. Right. Yarmouth set up a similar situation. They, um, we spent a lot of time, or Yarmouth folks spent a lot of time coming and talking to us about um, their development corporation. So we, we certainly do uh, function as a model for other communities who are looking to set up this type of operation. And, you know, for the record, we are very supportive of other towns wanting to do economic development. Um, we believe that um, other communities who engage in economic development help us as a region. Um, so it helps us clarify what we're really doing. And we do feel that the different towns in Cumberland County all have a slightly different product. So I think that makes us more comfortable in terms of working together as a, as a region. Um, and I think that's going to be very important. Um, certainly over the next 10 years, it really is about um, at least understanding what the external growth possibilities are. Um, most of your economic development does come from um, expanding businesses, but we don't want to ignore the fact that it would be um, helpful and useful and productive to um, attract certain types of companies here. Um, certainly the smaller companies on a fast growth track is really what we're looking at. Um, and that's really part of our outreach to some of the, um, that we do um, in partnership with some of our surrounding communities. So on that note, um, I think our budget is uh, fairly straightforward. Um, we have a total increase of about 3.6%. Um, it's about $8,000. That's all driven by wages and benefits. We have kept <coughs> our uh, operating expenses to a zero increase. And we've done that because in it, the way we've done that is we did increase our, um, our goal of raising external dollars. So we are increasing our fundraising by about 16%. Um, <laughs> that makes me a little nervous, but we, that's our goal. And that's what's going to uh, keep us at um, a 0% increase. Um, and I have to thank my board of directors because they're very supportive of that. Um, they are instrumental in helping us raise money to support um, the annual meeting. And that certainly is one of our, um, I think it's, it's our thank you to the community, to the business community, um, to say how valuable we think they are. And this is Scarborough's way of saying you're very important to us and we understand what you contribute um, you know, to the town. And I think I'm, I am very proud of the annual meeting. Um, I think we've taken it from, uh, you know, a, a good annual meeting to perhaps a really participatory, um, exciting meeting. So I have to admit, I, I do like the fact that it's the one time a year we get to come and get to see everybody. And I think things happen at the annual meeting by people talking to each other. Um, and I, I just, Again, very proud that we are engaging the, the business community. I think sometimes in other communities, that's the business community isn't appreciated as much as they could be. And again, this is part of our thank you to it. Um, and they've been very supportive, and the annual meeting basically pays for itself. Um, so, but that said, one of the things that we are um, going to be doing is selling some ads on our website to help raise that a little bit of extra money. So we'll see how that experiment goes. Right now we've been doing the ads as um, complementary to our sponsors. So in the future, for next year, we're going to um, go ahead and do some selling um, for folks who just want to be um, in the online directory and have a little bit more presence. Uh, my only comment closing is I had a chance to meet with the chair of SEDCO, Kevin Freeman. And um, so I express this to him personally, but I hope that you share with your entire board that it is greatly appreciated um, that their willingness to share your expertise and services with the planning department. And I really want to say thank you to the entire board for their cooperation in that. Excellent. Yes, they, they've been very supportive. Um, I think they also, they also appreciate um, what this 
this um, experiment of having, um, you know, some uh, in-house relationship with the planning department and working even closer. I think they're hoping to see some products out of this, like some additional reporting of, you know, growth and trends and all of that. So I think that's, um, they are extremely um, thoughtful and um, visionary in terms of understanding um, what this couple of months here in planning can do for um, both planning and for economic development. So I, I've got a, a couple questions. I'm looking through the budget drivers here, and I just want to—I I think I understand what's going on. Um, and we're—it's—it's—we're we're not talking major numbers here. I just want to make sure I get my head around it here. There is one mistake in the. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, well you made a correct mistake first, and then sure. I'll, the, and then I'll the, my answer. Sure. Um, there is. I think. Um, the original budget submitted to the town manager um, in, had an extra $2,500 toward the marketing that was cut out, and I think that one number in the budget driver didn't get um, didn't get changed when we said goodbye to our extra marketing funds. So that brings so that did answer the first question. Uh, the second question is um, or second question is uh, what does South Dakota have against us? I know. I, I, I know. It is. Um, they're just a. You know, I think the last time we looked at the, the numbers last year, I think there were four or five states that hadn't gone to our website, but this year, just one. I, I don't have a good answer for that. He's referring to um, when, we, when we looked, we pull our, um, we pull our, our um, um, when we look at our content on the website, we pull our analytics, and we have visitors from every state in the country, except for South Dakota. And um, yes, I don't have a good explanation. I feel like I should give them a call. Yeah, a so um, card or something. To say you know, remember us? Yes, exactly, yeah. okay. exactly. We we certainly do have a, we do have some international um, um, uh, contents, and hopefully they're not all like just trying to sell me new um, website information. I I will I will uh, certainly say that um, that there are some that are trying to sell us product, um, but. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Yeah, thank you. Are we going to live that day on that one? <laughs> <laughs> so, how much work? <laughs> Who are you looking at, Mr. Shell? <laughs> you looked at the librarian. <laughs> <laughs>
the, the $71,000 increase uh, uh, or revenue there is, is also reflected, as we'll see later on in the operational budget under vehicle maintenance parts. That's the increase that goes along with that. Sale of town property. Um, <coughs> If, if we're uh, approved for our budget pieces that we're uh, in the capital that we're looking for, we see that uh, we're proposing about a uh, $65,000 um, uh, return on, on some property. We've had some really good luck uh, this past year or so with, a, uh, with an online government-only uh, um, bidding service uh, that, that we've come across and uh, have been very successful not only uh, disposing of our property but other departments as well so it's worked out well for us. Um, so that's not real estate, that's equipment um, yeah, when we say sale of property. And then uh, the only other two pieces that might be of interest, uh, there's a $29,000 increase in the uh, MDOT's uh, Urban Rural Initiative, uh, that's the block money that is that is shared with us uh, from the state and it's an increase of $29,000. I'm, con I'm confident of that number in that uh, I talked to Pete Coughlin at the main local roads and made sure that, that was actually happening. And then unfortunately uh, on, the, on the decrease is a decrease of $14,000 uh, through the state emergency management planning grant uh, that we were fortunate enough to have for a number of years that Chief Thurlow Secured, he also uh, benefited from that grant as well as a few other departments. So, uh, with that, if there's any other questions in revenue, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Just a quick question, Mike. The, uh, the MDOT, uh, uh, Dave, that's, that's not PACS or anything, or is that PACS? No, no, that, 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 that's, our share, that's our share of, uh, of uh, gas tax uh, monies from, from the state. So, it's like a block grant? Yeah, it's a block grant. Okay. So, it's actually what they used to call it, the, 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 the block grant. Okay. Absolutely. So we'll move on to um, operational budget. I'm actually working off of the line item piece that's in the back of your budget book. Um, so when I turn to that, that could be found at tab 10. The public works just near the back. Starts on page 43. Um, again, I'll, I'll bring you through a few highlights of the operational budget as I see them, and then we can start to talk further. Uh, just to start off with our my overall, uh, the overall increase for the budget is about $112,000 or 1.7 percent. Working down through the divisions uh, within the within the department, uh, administration is fairly unremarkable in its increase. Uh, $3,000 is for uh, some a, uh, a lease for our, our multi multi-purpose printer scanner machine that we have. Um, sorry, Mike, you got to let us catch up here. Oh. Sorry. We're a little lost in this budget. There's two or three different budget details. Page 43 is the board. Yeah. <coughs> you thought you said 33, and I'm like, what? Uh, I beg your pardon. Sorry. I thought I said no, 33. No, no, no. Our fault. Okay, sorry. Thanks. Um, and that will conclude the budget review. <laughs> 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 thank you for your support. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so page 43 is the administrative uh, division within the public works. Uh, one and a half percent increase. Uh, nothing too extraordinary there. Uh, salaries and benefit increases. There is a $3,000 increase. It's a new line um, that we have for the multi-purpose printer that we have. But if you look up above, you see a $2,000 decrease in contracted services. So uh, that's basically a wash. I would just take a moment to, to mention that our longtime deputy director, Dick Collins, has announced retirement at the end of June. Glad you clarified that because when I read the net narrative, it didn't provide detail and I was getting a little nervous when Mr. Shaw was heading. <laughs> 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 but Dick has uh, worked his way up through the, the yeah. crew, uh, been with us 40 years. 40 years. 40 years. Wow. Uh, his institutional knowledge uh, you know, will fairly be lost. and. Uh, 
He only lives just over off Broad Turn Road. So He's not going too far. We'll keep a we'll, we'll keep a close eye. When <laughs> I mean, you need a plow guy, exactly. 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 Next page is under GIS engineering, and um, you see a 21.2 percent increase there. That is actually my third of a, of a, of a very good find in, uh, in Carrie Stroke, who is the sustainability coordinator. Um, I would certainly say that uh, that $19,000 there is, is uh, well spent and then some, as, as we'll talk later on about a, uh, an initiative to change over to streetlights to LEDs and so forth and so on. So that's that. Uh, you look further down, special projects, the contractual services and NIPTES, which is National Pollution Discharge Elimination Systems, which is our stormwater permit requirement. Uh, you'll note that there is a $20,000 increase in that line. And that $20,000 increase uh, is there because with discussion with, the, with Tom, uh, if you remember last year, the capital budget, I had a $25,000 BMP, Best Management Practice Maintenance uh, line, that is no longer in there. Uh, that is used for maintaining the stolen water ponds and so forth that we have to have uh, for, for, for compliance. Um, it's an annual expense, it's an ongoing expense, so therefore it, it, it really uh, belongs more in the operational budget than not. Um, you know, there's, it, it just does. So that's, that's, the, that's the change there. Um, Moving on to page 45, this is Public Works Operations. This is kind of the stuff that uh, most people think that uh, is, is the meat of what we do, and it is. Uh, what you will see in here, uh, there's actually a, a decrease of 7 tenths of a percent, but there are a few items in here that are worth mentioning. Contracted services had an increase of $39,000. That $39,000 increase is something uh, that I want to try for the upcoming budget cycle. We have, currently we have two street sweepers. Um, one of the street sweepers is a 17-year-old Elgin tenant sweeper that, um, that that company no longer is in, in business and it has a number of proprietary parts on it. We've been real creative over the years make, keeping that thing in, in service and uh, the vehicle maintenance staff came to me and just said, it's, it's time to give it its last rights, Mike. Let's park it. We parked it last fall, and, and that's where it's going to stay. Um, and so we do still have a fairly frontline piece in a, in a, in a, uh, in a sweeper, in, a ten, in, a, in an Elgin sweeper. And so um, sweeping is one of those things where you have a big rush first thing in the spring where you need to get out, get it all done, and be done with it so that people can start enjoying the streets for the six months of summer that we have. Um, so, in discussion with Tom, my thought is is that we can we can probably well I know we can thir I've, I've looked her up to thirty nine thousand dollars we can rent we can we can hire a sweeping company to come in with their sweeper and in conjunction with our sweepers we still have we, we have two sweepers essentially for the first part of the season get that first rush of sweeping out of the way um, and then after that we have a sweeper that we can use for emergency spills which we do all the time cleanups. Maintenance sweeping. Uh, maintenance sweeping is something we have to do under uh, uh, our permit for stormwater uh, in the Red Brook area and that sort of thing. So it allows us to do those sorts of things. I think it's a good idea to try that for a season, see how it works out, because a sweeper is the better part of $350,000 to buy one outright. Uh, I think the town, <coughs> the town, a town of this size should have its own sweeper. Uh, does it need two sweepers? I'm thinking maybe not. Maybe this is a way to keep a good level of customer service and also save some money and be more reasonable with that. So that's that's the rationale behind that. Can I ask you a, can I have another <coughs> question about street sweeping? Sure. Not that I'm really, it's just kind of hit me right now. So you, 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 you sweep the street because uh, some of them are uh, granted uh, requirements. Uh, where do you keep what you sweep and doesn't, don't, are we simply just transferring the same thing that we're worried about getting into the stormwater into a different water? Different source that no, street, street, street sweeping is, uh, first off, street sweeping is, is not, not considered a hazardous waste. So we're able to take those street sweepings um, and we quantify how, many we, how, how much we pick up. It actually, we're very fortunate that we have the Holmes Road site right next to the Beach Ridge Speedway. 
um, and those those materials are used either for for, for fill cover or uh, used for beneficial use in, in certain projects that we may have where we need deep fills or something like that. And um, um, it, it just so it stays sequestered on that site and does not go into go into the streams and that sort of thing. Okay. Yeah. Trying to get too deep. <laughs> So uh, just a quick question on the contracted services. I mean, uh, it's, it sounds great this year. We're at 39,000. I mean, if, uh, I'd like to keep an eye on that too because, uh, you know, if it's we, we talked about this for public safety too. That the more we contract out, it might be an initial savings, but long term we don't have control over the rates or what's going to happen. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm all for you know looking at it as long as we kind of put a little asterisk next to it, track it for maybe a couple of years and see. How, how long is the contract in this just one year or well, so just, well I have a budget for one year but we've not we've not entered into uh, any any formal okay. contracts or anything like that okay this is this is this is budget pricing sure uh, I actually went through an analysis where we looked at uh, what, what it would cost to rent like this uh, we did our, our own cost of, of ownership on on sweepers and then also some leasing options and straight rental options and that sort of thing yeah and this was this was in, in range with uh, and actually uh, probably 20 or 30 dollars less than what it was costing us to own and operate our own. Okay. Sweepers are just one of those things where they just they, they, they destroy themselves from the first day you bring them on. Okay. on, on, uh, on there. Yeah, I just don't want to be in a position like you know where we get we get obligated to a contractor or a vendor and then all of a sudden our rates double or whatever in a year and we can't. And we can't no, we're not signing long-term contracts. Mm -hmm. okay. We're doing like week, weekly contracts. Um, you know, or even daily, frankly, as needed. Um, and I'm, I'll accept, I guess, responsibility for this. I was really blown over by the sticker shock of the cost of just the upfront capital costs. Um, and then to operate it, as Mike says, from day one, they tear themselves apart. Um, the brushes wear down, and they're just constant maintenance headaches. So I think long term, this is a far more cost effective solution for us. Um, and I, to think what you'd be looking at in the capital budget with a, an additional three hundred fifty thousand dollar request. Well, and again, understood. But if, if it's something, if it's a need, and we budget it accordingly, so we know in three to five or whatever it is that that's going to be a capital, budget, we can plan for that a little bit better. So. I think we'll always need to have one. Right. The question is, did we need two? And that's really um, that's really the issue. Um, you know, go, going down through. There's a next line item down, winter salt. Uh, that's a $10,000 increase. I really wish I had a crystal ball for figuring out how to how to truly budget for salt and, and uh, know what the weather was going to be. Um, but this is that that uh, that number represents uh, what we figured the unit cost of salt is going to be on the next bid with uh, the tonnage that we typically have used over the last five years. That's kind of how we got arrived at that. Magnesium chloride, we're starting to get a little bit better handle on that, and we realized we could drop that, uh, discount that by about $9,400. Um, and then I guess I'll, I'll also mention lastly the asphalt paving. I've, uh, I've actually decreased that by $450,000, uh, for, excuse me, $42,000. Uh, that's a reflection of trying to, trying to meet, some, uh, meet some requirements with, uh, with my overall budget increase and that sort of thing. Yeah, I would also just note on this page, and you'll see it elsewhere, but uh, I don't know how many staff are included in the operations line, but uh, you'll note the uh, 17 are included here. Full-time staff is down, pension is down, but insurance is up. That's really a reflection of a changing workforce. We had a 50-year employee retire, a 35-year employee retire, and we're hiring you know, newer people with uh, younger with families, and they don't have sort of they're not commanding the same salary and therefore the pension costs aren't as great. Uh, Jacqueline Mandrake, our HR director, has uh, arranged some interge intergenerational conversations uh, because the workplace is changing uh, right before our eyes and public works is, you really see it up front. And by the way, we've got some really great hires. Some people that we brought on are going to be Good. wonderful uh, long-term employees that are going to contribute greatly to the to the organization and to the town. So we're very excited about that. And, and not not to expedite your process at all, but we talked about a succession plan as well. Is that uh, in the past? Is that something we still have a challenge with? Well, I mean, 
I mean, obviously, with uh, with uh, Deputy Director leaving, I mean, we we have a we have a key role there that we're gonna we're gonna need to uh, to fill, and we'll be looking internally and externally on that. Uh, we've got, like I said, the, the, the folks we've hired over the last few years have got tremendous talent and, and, and ability. So we have uh, certainly some, uh, some some more junior uh, supervisory positions that are uh, when those become available, we we will have people that we can plug in and. So we're very, I'm, I'm very pleased about it. I'm, I'm very enthusiastic and, and uh, optimistic about, about that part of public works. That means you can't retire for 10 years, you know. Yeah. I wish I could retire in 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> you can't get rid of me that easily. <laughs> so, so, Mike, uh, just a couple things on the paving. Um, is that is that just maintenance paving kind of thing or resurfacing type stuff? So are we, yes. are we going to get behind where we're going to now start having more complaints about road conditions or... No, I mean the, the uh, this is the maintenance paving and the, and the small items. Uh, the the mid level paving and the CIP is the one that is the road reclamations uh, and, the, and the heavier overlays and, and that sort of thing. Okay. Um, I, I think we're I think we're going to be all set with this. Um, yeah, I don't see I don't see a problem. With it. Okay. Mike alluded to it, and I don't think I mentioned to you. Uh, before you saw my proposed budget, uh, I made a final correction. It was a $200,000 reduction, and I portioned that out kind of by, uh, fortunately, by percentage of the total budget. Um, Mike elected to hit that paving account fairly hard to meet that requirement. Mm -hmm. um, that was his prerogative. We talked about it. Um, but desperate times sometimes require desperate measures. Yeah, I just don't want to trade one problem for another and, you know, have people, mm -hmm. you know, to that. That, that phone doesn't necessarily stop ringing. <laughs> oh, we're, we're on the other end. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, page 46, those are just uh, cemetery items, memorial accounts, shade trees, uh, nothing nothing extraordinary there, just some uh, some minor adjustments. They're small, small ticket items anyway, uh, other than uh, the contracted mowing services that we have for the cemeteries and uh, beyond that. There's nothing too, too much to, to note there. And page 47. Page 47 is the vehicle maintenance uh, vehicle maintenance department division that we have. And you'll note that uh, there's a, a small percentage change in the, the full-time pay. Um, nothing, uh, nothing extraordinary there. Uh, parts and services I mentioned earlier that uh, there's a 71,000 Seventy-four thousand is the three thousand is an extra um, uh, parts parts cost from some of the other the other departments. The seventy-four thousand dollar increase, though, that is the uh, has offsetting revenue to it. So we have a total increase in vehicle maintenance division alone of two point one percent. Yes, the gas fifty-two thousand dollar decrease. I mean, those are. Uh, so that, that's, a, that's an indication of fewer miles driven, more, uh, more fuel efficient vehicles. Um, if, you, uh, if you like Karen, buy her leaf, that'll, that'll continue to, to go in that direction and, uh, and that sort of thing. You're going to have electric plow trucks next? <laughs> <laughs> Talk about range anxiety. I'm going to get one of those things back to the yeah. stuff. <laughs> yeah. um, Street lights, uh, an interesting point we'll talk about this earlier, uh, later on in, in capital is uh, you see $185,000 uh, cost for, uh, for street lights, rental and electricity. Uh, that uh, is, a, is a fair number that we can change here uh, later on in the budget. Um, minor increase uh, in new equipment, excuse me, on page 48, uh, minor increase in new equipment for um, the electrical department and that is actually traffic signals. Uh, a lot of the traffic signals have been upgraded, but there are some, uh, I think specifically of uh, the main med campus, uh, that is not likely to, there's not likely to have any other sort of development that's going to allow for other sources of funding from private enterprise to, to upgrade those. That particular intersection is in really bad shape. Scarborough Downs intersection, for instance, that one will let go uh, and, and keep, keep maintained because of potential future uh, changes there and those sorts of things, but we do need to do some, some traffic signal upgrades uh, and updates, and so that's, that's an attempt to do some of those. And we can do most of those in-house. Uh, we've been spending some time doing some training with one of our employees to get their certifications to do those sorts of things. So what does that entail? Is that just equipment swap-outs for more efficient lights, or is that it is. programming and 
com, you know, uh, all, all, that, type stuff. all of that stuff comes with it. So when you put the new traffic heads up, when you put new back shading on, uh, we, we've done a few things over the last few years. Like uh, I don't know, whether you drive up the Route One corner or some of the other ones. If you ever noticed the, the sun shades, half of them were busted out and they were broken up and they just kind of looked ratty. We replaced some of those. Some new signal heads, the wiring and that sort of thing, especially over main med, is going to need to be addressed here in the very near future. Um, and then uh, where to next? Uh, solid waste on page 49 uh, brings us to the last of the, of the operational budget. Uh, about a $20,000 increase in the eco main tipping fee. That is not because the tipping fee is increasing, but it's because of people's uh, habits of, of, of disposal. Uh, honestly, probably a, probably a, a little bit of what everybody's seeing an, an uptick in solid waste with uh, the economy getting better or people feeling better about it, I guess, if nothing else. And though we were just today, we we launched, uh, or early next month, we'll launch the food waste pilot. Mm -hmm. It's only 200 homes, and so uh, we do have some regional collection. Uh, there could be significant savings in the future if we're able to roll that out townwide. Uh, it's projected in as much as 30% of uh, weight of solid waste is uh, actually compostable. So there's a way we can get that out of our waste stream because we're paying by the ton. It would be big savings to the bottom line, but we're certainly not in any position to book any savings now. We need some time to understand this better. So I guess that brings us down to the bottom line, which I mentioned earlier, which was a 1.7% increase and $112,000. Is there any questions further on the operational budget? We'd love to have to find Okay. Just for those at home, this is it's a 6.8 million dollar budget that we're talking about. So it's uh, I give Mike a lot of credit for coming in where he is. And that leads us to capital projects and capital equipment. Any preference? Which one first, Tom? Capital equipment. Uh, capital equipment, uh, just a general overview of how I approach capital equipment and the need for funding on that. Um, as you know, public works by its nature is very equipment intensive, and so we try to normalize that annual cost, and by doing to do that, we replace one of our 15, uh, one of our 15 plow trucks on an annual basis, or we like to. Uh, we replace one of our 10 Light, light vehicles, which is a one time low on an annual basis. And uh, so the, the purpose behind that <coughs> is, is to annualize the cost, but also uh, we, have, we have found, and I've seen it myself uh, in the 20 years I've been here, uh, when, when you have a situation where you, where you defer, sooner or later you have to take and, and purchase and replace these vehicles, and then you get into cluster buying. And so you, you buy two or three or four plow trucks. The downside to that is when you buy two or three or four vehicles, all vehicles have their own flaws. And so instead of having one vehicle with a particular flaw, you have four vehicles with that same flaw and you have to live with it for, <clears throat> you know, in, in our instance, these, these plow trucks are in the 16th and 17th year when they're getting turned out. So you have 17 years of misery uh, depending on if you get a really bad batch. So that's another reason for, for not cluster buying and the same with pickup trucks. So uh, we have a 10-wheel dump truck that we're looking to replace uh, this year uh, for a cost of $205,000, and that is the truck and gear only. We reuse the sander hoppers that we have in the slide-in hoppers for sanding and salting. Uh, those are stainless steel, and what we will do with those when we when we pull it out, we will go through go through it thoroughly, uh, replace bearings, drives, and that sort of thing. But the the, the box itself, which is really all it is. is Something that uh, that can be reused for another cycle in the vehicle, and then the, uh, the the pickup truck is just that. It's a it's a three quarter ton crew truck. Uh, we have a uh, we have two crew trucks. We typically on a on a regular basis have two crews doing excavation type work uh, uh, throughout the summer, and those are equipped with the appropriate hand tools, safety equipment, and that sort of thing. So it's uh, it's a, a, a piece that gets used on a regular basis. Uh, you'll also note uh, I have two other, uh, actually three other items in there. Mike, could I just stop you there? Yep. Uh, Mike's been doing some really interesting analysis that we'll, we need to 
refine it a bit further before we share, but it, it really intends to look, it's actually uh, taking every piece of this equipment and uh, attributing the annual maintenance cost with it uh, to the penny as close as we yeah. can. Yeah. So we can really get a sense of when vehicles are starting to cost us. And I think the other piece that I want to suggest you look at um, uh, the depreciation, kind of the, the resale value, because obviously that would decrease over time. That could be factors in that calculation. And what I really want to do is validate that our, our, our schedules are on track. And maybe we can recalibrate them up, up or down, depending on what we find. But we'll be pleased to share that data with you when we have it refined. It is pretty neat right now. We're, we're replacing on by, by the by the oldest vehicle essentially, um, but we're getting to the point now with with our city work software uh, that that we can actually identify a cost per mile to operate these vehicles. So it's pretty exciting stuff, and uh, we're really working on. It. Steve Buckley, who is our GIS person, also our data specialist, is, is working on that for me. Uh, the heavy truck lifts. <coughs> We, we currently have a set of heavy truck lifts, and, and these are just what, what they say they are. They're, they're lifts that will pick up the fire truck, the dump truck, or anything like that. Um, they're a huge, uh, they, they, make, they make working on these vehicles much more efficient. Uh, I would also suggest that they're, they, they probably save on uh, vehicle tax bodies, because instead of getting on and off creepers and dragging themselves underneath, they can stand under them uh, and work on the vehicle in a, in a, in a, in a more uh, comfortable fashion. Um, we we have a we, it, we, we have a, a foot race out to the lifts every morning to see who's going to grab them for their for their day because we usually have uh, as many as two or three heavy trucks are working on in the course of the day at the same time. This is another set of lifts that would allow us to uh, to be able to work another another truck at the same time. And you know this is one of the one of the outcomes of uh, I, I think we, we're seeing a more demand on these lifts with with. Uh, Old Orchard and, and Westbrook, uh, excuse me, and, and Wells and, uh, and Bar Mills uh, coming in and being being worked on, and so I think it would be a be a good good expenditure, and they they're a, they're a long lasting piece, so they certainly uh, fit into the capital uh, capital budget, and, and they'd be an appropriation. Um, the other piece I have, I have a heating, ventilation, and air conditioning upgrade uh, in this. This, this current year, I have $82,000. I'm asking for another $82,000. Uh, the heating and air conditioning system, uh, the ventilation system at Public Works uh, in, the, in the admin area came with the building, so it's 35 years old. Uh, but what, what a lot of this money would go towards is replacing the heating system that is in the bays. It's, it's got a forced air system. That really isn't efficient. Uh, I know that the fire department has found great efficiencies with the infrared heating system that they have in their uh, firehouses now, uh, in their bays, and, and that's where I would like to move towards. So that's it's fascinating. That infrared technology doesn't heat the space, it heats the item, um, and there's a radiant component to that. Um, but that's uh, essentially how it works, and it's uh, far more uh, energy efficient at the same time particularly in areas where you have great heat, heat loss, when they open that garage bay door, everything's in there, uh, all the heat escapes very, very quickly uh, before you can close it again. So infrared is really the way to go, particularly in these bays. As, as crazy as it is, the, the, the piping system that we have has a type of joint in it that if you cool them down, they shrink and it leaks. Mm -hmm. We leave the heat on in the summertime so that we can circulate warm water to them so we keep those, those swell. It, it's just, just a bad design. So that's that's the purpose behind the HVAC. And then uh, in the in the equipment line, the only other thing I have for this year is thirty-five thousand dollars, and for a traffic uh, traffic camera system, uh, span wire cap, cap, uh, traffic camera upgrade at the intersection of Gorham Road and Payne. We've got a lot of failing traffic loops in that intersection, and there's a lot of lanes there. And so rather than replace loops, which uh, when you have that many loops to replace, can be quite expensive. There is a new technology. Traffic cameras typically don't work well on wires because wires bounce up and down and you don't get a good view. So that's why they go mostly on, on mast arms. There's a new technology out there that um, kind of, it's almost like a gimbal. And so it works a lot better on those wires. So we, we, we feel that that would be a, a great intersection to try that, that new technology and see how it works for us. Um, it's been around for a couple of years. It's not like it's the, the first time it's ever been done. So. That's uh, that's the 
purpose behind that. And we're proposing to fund that with reserves. There are traffic impact fee accounts that uh, are appropriate for this purpose. That's capital equipment, unless there are any questions on that. Yeah, I got a couple questions. You know, the, uh, the HVAC upgrade, do you get phase two? Is there any other phases, or is this the final phase? That's it. That's it. Yeah. And then uh, I'm going to put my annual plug in uh, with the town manager that I think all municipal vehicles should have the same kind of numbering system as public works, so that I believe. Mike, would you like to address that? We're working on that as they come in. As, as they come in for uh, Tom actually tasked me with that after last budget cycle, and so uh, any any vehicle that has an actual municipal plate. Yep. Now obviously, there are vehicles that do not have municipal plates. It would not be a good idea to have numbers on them right. for obvious reasons. Uh, but for instance, uh, you know, any any vehicle, mine included, uh, the one that I'm that I operate, has got numbering system on it. As vehicles are coming in and being serviced from other divisions and so forth, uh, they are, and I've made sure that all of our stuff is. Good. Mike, how, how far along are we through the fleet at this point? I would say we're two thirds of the way through at this point. Rather than pulling them off the vehicle as they yeah, come no. in in their regular maintenance cycle, we're lettering them. Yeah, it was more public service uh, announcement kind of thing. Was people would say, "Oh, look at the bright shiny new truck," and you yep. could say, "Oh, look at that second number there or the first number." That's actually the year it was. A good conversation start. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, for sure. absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you. And then the one that's near and dear to everybody's heart: capital projects. Uh, page seven. Yeah, We've got a couple of really, uh, really exciting projects here, um, or, or at least I find them exciting. It's maybe a, a comment on what I find exciting and I need to get a life. But uh, mid-level road rehabilitation, that, that is one that you've seen for a number of years, and that is the, the, one, the, the, the projects that are the more uh, in-depth road reconstruction projects that are done in-house uh, that, that are not contracted. So those are the more rural roads, the roads that don't have uh, subsurface drainage issues and so forth. There'll be reclamations or uh, pavement milling. Uh, we're, we're actually at a point now where we're able to, to do pavement milling as opposed to full depth reclamations, which uh, is, is an indication that we're kind of getting a handle on a lot of our paving issues and that sort of thing. So. About that. So I was at PACS today and an interesting thing came up, and I don't know how we do this, but they were talking about scheduling road maintenance around utility infrastructure projects like water, uh, gas, or do we have a program like that or how do we, how does that work? I know we, every town's different and, you know, do, do they we give been, them our budget or how we, we, we've been doing We've been doing that for years, Chris. Okay. Um, and, and, and the way that we do that is we're always keeping in contact with the utilities so we know ahead of time if they've got some projects that they've got to do. Yeah. But really where, where, where it benefits us is that when we have a project that we're looking to do, we always reach out to them, make sure that they uh, are, are, are aware of that and they go into uh, and, and they work with us. Pleasant Hill Road is an example where uh, when we were rebuilding that road, we were also the, the, the same contractor uh, not at our cost was was replacing the water main, and so you know those are examples of what we've done uh, done it on a number of the projects. But we're the last thing we ever want to do with either the either myself as public works or utility is to go in and build a road only to have it opened up within a year or two because there was not that communication. Yeah. Um, so oftentimes we'll, we'll with, uh, a utility will piggyback on with us. Uh, although there is some additional uh, contract management in that sort of thing, and what I've done in the past, I've, I've assessed a percentage of, of the contract as a, as, a, as a fee for handling those sorts of things, so there's a number of different ways we handle that as well. But overall, the project, I mean, ends up being a cost saver, really, because you're getting, well, it's been a cost saver, but you're getting more efficiency out of that process. A absolutely. Yeah. Getting more efficiency out of the process, and, and the pain is happening once instead of numerous times. Um, one of the projects that I'm, 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 I'm very pleased about is, is a, uh, we've already, we're already in the first phase of it and we're, we're being funded and actually it's going to be done the end of May is this subsurface drainage assessment project. We have over 70 miles of subsurface drainage in town and a lot of that drainage is getting to the age where it is getting into the, the end of its useful life. Corrugated metal pipe has a 30 year lifespan. We certainly have a bunch of subdivisions that are at that age and beyond. And 
so what we're, what we're attempting to do with this assessment is to uh, go out there, we camera all the lines, uh, we have a, then we have a, an, an asset management, an asset database of that because it's a very expensive system that we have underground. And we can also then take a step back, look at what we have, look at the issues, and create a thoughtful capital improvement rehabilitation project. <clears throat> the, 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 the new, there's new techniques out there for rehabilitating pipe systems that don't, that don't um, require complete replacement, open digging, and that sort of thing. Uh, much less expensive, much less interruption to the, to, to the traveling public and that sort of thing. So we're in the first phase of that right now, and I actually just had a, had a progress meeting today with uh, Ted, the Ted Berry Company, who is the uh, selected contractor, and uh, it's, it's pretty neat stuff. Um, that, that is uh, scheduled to go on for three more years, um, and we'll be able to create, like I said, this, this we have a lot of cost of, cost of failure, the consequence of failure, what happens, it's graded. It's it's based on environmental factors. It's based on you know depth of pipe. It's it's a very very good system, and it's a system that's used throughout the United States to be able to make these sorts of decisions. Um, the next one down is um, you've you've seen planning uh, planning money requested for the Gorm Road reconstruction. Here it is. This is uh, the first phase. Uh, Wentworth to Maple Avenue. You see a price tag there of 2.2 million. That's that's the full cost, but there is the actual anticipated net cost for us for the town is uh, is a million five because we've uh, identified and I have uh, uh, agreements with the DOT and PACs for 750 thousand dollars in funding uh, to offset some of that cost, and uh, we would like to get going on that uh, the spring of 2018. In the meantime, uh, you know, to your point, we, uh, we do have uh, some utilities that have to go on the road. Uh, the, the gas main replacement is one of them. Hopefully that's going to happen this year because that's a big undertaking. And so get, get those utilities in and, that, and then go after the road um, if it gets funded. So just a quick question for, for, the, for the manager. So it's, it's 2.2 on here, but we're really looking at 1.5. So how do we how do we reconcile that to this bottom line here? Because that's the bottom line is going to be the request, right? It's a revenue offset. Revenue offset. Okay. Okay. And that's we will see that that's in this revenue offset. Yes, this budget. Okay. And only one more project. So that's the LED streetlight retrofit project, and uh, that is a, a seven hundred thousand dollar expense. But that project has a return on investment in four and a half years. That's the conversion and the town taking over ownership of uh, LED streetlights. So there's a savings in electricity and cost and better quality lighting. And it's a, a really exciting project. There is an exhibit uh, in tab 9, page 4, which is exhibit 2A. It provides a summary of this project. This project, our sustainability coordinator, has taken the lead on it. Uh, really since the first day we started, it has been uh, vetted through the Energy Committee. Uh, I think that's certainly part of that conversation. Um, the narrative in the CIP is a bit different in terms of the uh, return on investment. I believe the exhibit um, is more accurate. It has a projected return of 7.4 years. Um, essentially, there will be annual savings of about $95,000 so we'll recoup that uh, in just over seven years. Yeah, the, the, we, we talked about this before too, Tom, I think. The maintenance, are we going to have to assume maintenance for these things now? or is that, um, There are options. We could contract with a private independent party approved by CMP. We could, CMP offers that themselves. Uh, Mike is, uh, I think we're uniquely in the position of having equipment already, bucket truck and skilled labor to, to actually do that. The beauty of these, uh, this technology is that um, they really don't require much maintenance. So at most, it'd be all new infrastructure, essentially. Uh, we're looking at switching out lamps, but those will run a very long time. So we expect in the near term, there's little or no maintenance required. So so we have qualified staff who could do that. Could we choose to pursue it that way? Yep, we actually do. We have, uh, we have staff that have uh, international municipal... Electrical, 
It's yeah, a certified. It's a certification <laughs> for, for, for street lights uh, as well as traffic lights. So yeah. Right. We already have the investment in the uh, the bucket truck, which is an essential piece. Yep. And will we talk about putting other potential infrastructure on these things or you know, whether it's cameras or other devices or something? Are we still looking at that or exploring that or this proposal does not include just anything else. This is just for uh, um, relamping its new fixtures and, and bulbs, okay. obviously. Okay. Luckily, it does have it. They do have seven pin dust to dawn connectors, so those will, it, it's geared up for that in the future. Okay. Uh, all the way through. So it's been thought of. I'll just throw a shout out to, to Mike and his staff. Uh, to save some money, there we, we are working with a consultant to help us kind of navigate this. It's, uh, it's fairly complicated, highly technical, um, but one of the most important things is to have a good sound inventory. And many places, many communities rely on a consultant to go out there physically, GPS, all these locations. Mike and his crew have done all that, so we've got a very solid in uh, inventory in house. Uh, location, type of fixture, you know, you name it, it has all the attribute data along with it. So that saved us some money and, and really sped this project along. Is there money in that 701 for the consultant to do the uh, the evaluation piece or something? Because we, we, I remember in Energy we talked about the type of light, the lighting locations. Uh, you know, do we do we just go through and rip up, you know, replace everything we have? Do we do an, a needs assessment or evaluation or something to see could we? Yes, I, I believe this cost is all in, including okay. the consulting help, okay. and part of that uh, consulting effort would be an evaluation of where and how many and what intensity uh, light do we need. Okay. So the only other last question I have is, um, and it came up last night in, at regular council, was the, um, uh, the DEP fuel station. Has that been taken out, or was that going to be in a different... Um, We're going to talk about that, I think, next. That's yeah, that's, current, that's in the current FY17 budget. Okay. Um, so th that's a project that uh, you know, Mike is certainly the near and dear to him. He's overseeing that project. One of the challenges of that project uh, is that we've selected a consultant, uh, a contractor, and that project is due to commence um, first week of May. So we need to get some direction sooner than later if we could. Yeah, but I just didn't see it on the not the uh, project plan. Because it was in last year. No, it's already funded. It's that's currently <laughs> funded and it won't, that's, that's the last. Oh, it's currently approved. approved. Currently approved yeah. because of the budget. It has so the budget, budget authority. Last, yeah. Budget approval. Okay. But we're going to talk about it after. Thanks. Then yeah. again, um, I, I still, you know, I, I have an operation. It is. I, I haven't seen any, any, certainly haven't seen any decrease in services or I haven't heard any complaints. Other than the usual, yeah, well, <laughs> the, yeah the usual. Much, too, you're plowing too much snow at the end of my driveway. Yeah, yeah. I can start all the. You yeah. have that much snow. Well, you're the one that gets all those calls. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So, thank you very thank much. You. Um, the next item is general budget discussion. Um, really, um, although um, Councilor Hayes, who's the chair of this committee, um, is not aware of this yet, but uh, as far as uh, no, let me rephrase that. I think he's aware that we were, had intention to send the bond question that was before the council last night back to the finance committee for review. I don't believe he's aware yet of the um, issue regarding the DEP uh, tank replacement um, or this conversation. So when he does get back in town um, on Friday, that we'll definitely have that conversation. But I did ask Tom to um, and staff to take a look at that list to begin the prioritization process for them, but then also provide us an update um, regarding that project and then also the, um, the charter uh, language uh, to focus on both the uh, approval process but then also the uh, declaring an emergency issue and seeking some type of advice. So, Tom, I'm going to turn it over to sure. you. Um, a couple of things you had asked about the excise history. Yes. Um, I have a copy of that. Oh, thank you. Oh, wow. um, thank also, there is um, on the planning capital yep. for the lease. The planning department received uh, $55,000 for a trade in, in this year, and Dan's plan was to use those revenues to offset part of that purchase for next year. So that's what the mix was. So 7500 was to be appropriated, 5000 essentially oh. now is going to be coming from 
um, current year revenue to offset the other. Thank you. So I'm distributing uh, three different things. Just yep. Thank you. Thank you. Speak a little bit back. I might suggest we look at this form first. We good. Uh, this will be hopefully somewhat familiar to you. It's in a slightly different form, but it's, uh, it contains much of the inf information on the bond order that you approved last night in first reading. Uh, the first column is, in fact, what you approved last evening. And you'll notice the shaded area is that fuel station replacement. One of the tasks that you gave me last night was for Ruth and I to spend some time to look back through these and uh, see what what is necessary, what we must move forward, what we might be able to put on hold. And so there's some note column, uh, look at the note column on the far right that explains kind of the status of each of these. So the, the reimbursed general fund, essentially we have already purchased these items and the bond proceeds would actually just be reimbursing us. Um, the other ones are fairly self-explanatory that they're eminent, that it's some work planned. There were a number of projects that were taken off, um, notably in the second category, the Cummings Road reconstruction that we, that we, were, we would propose that could come off uh, that bond order and not be bonded. We're waiting on uh, some information from South Portland on that, so what we're doing is the total project cost was initially budgeted at 495,000. We've already bonded uh, almost half of that, 245,000. Uh, so we still have those funds to use up before we do this this piece if needed. So that's why we decided to hold off on that. And then on the flip side, uh, the school projects for the current year, there's furnishings, replacement, and renewal. Uh, Kate Bolton has advised that uh, <coughs> that could be removed as well. What was that? Uh, furnishings. Oh, I see. Yeah. And so there's a, a modest decrease uh, down from four million. We'd be looking to bond uh, 3.63. So the bond order would be the three million eight fifty, and then we would actually go up to bond on the three million six thirty. So. Um, I guess I, I, I got a question I don't want to see. Um, I need to understand the cash flow of this, I guess, in some way. So before the town council approves the purchase of something, staff can go out and purchase it using cash and then come back to us asking to then finance it. Technically, the way it really should work is at the time we do the budget and we authorize the, uh, the expenditure, the ability to expend the funds, uh, our bond council has recommended that at that point in time we also authorize the funding for it. Uh, unfortunately, budget is such a huge process that the bonding piece tends to uh, lag a little bit. Yeah, it kind of gets pushed to the side. And um, the second reason we tend to wait is we could, you know, we could we could have done a bond order for the Cummings Road for the full 495000 for example, and maybe we only needed the 250000 So at that point, we would have to come back and essentially ask council to deauthorize the bond order. And, and that's not necessarily an issue, but, you know. Yeah, because we've done, I know, both when I was on the school board, but even even on the council, we, I mean, there were some items that would sit out there for 10 years and never get, um, for whatever, for, for priority purposes, never was funded or never was undertaken, a project was undertaken or something wasn't bought. Um, and we did a big cleanup several right. years ago, remember? We I think did. we had at least a commitment, if, I don't know, if a policy to really make sure nothing goes beyond five years, because then obviously it's not a priority if it's gone five years without actually being undertaken. So um, I get that. Um, for the items that we, 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 uh, we intend to reimburse ourselves, we do file a declaration of intent. So there's some paperwork up front that, that uh, expresses that intent and it enables us to, to do it kind of after the fact, if you will. Uh, not after the fact, but after the item is mm -hmm. completed or purchased. And IRS rules say that we can't reimburse ourselves if we do not have that. So we, we have that, I have that up in the I do it July 1st for every item that's listed as bonding. So back to 
Well, I, sh I should say the other secondary question. I think so, I'd like to ask more questions about this before oh, please, I yeah, be please. complicated with analysis on a bigger scale. Um, my initial, I've already made a comment from Chris. If you want to go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. So, I, first of all, I, I want to say thank you because obviously you've been able to take a look at um, look at the items and um, put a uh, better assessment. It's not a huge change, but it is a change. So, just on the municipal side, it was originally 2.9 million. It's now 2.7 million, and on the school side, it was originally uh, 1.3 million. It's now down to about 1.2, and I'm rounding, I'm rounding up. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate that effort. Um, and I actually, uh, the other, the secondary question I have is that, so the amount to be bonded will be 3.6 million now instead of 4.2. The question I have is that why is then the order is that the bond is not to exceed 3.85? which was the, basically the, um, before the adjustment. So why, why would they not equal? Uh, normally what we do is there's, uh, the first phase of how, we know, how we're doing it in Scarborough is we have the budget that's approved, and then, uh, but we don't have the funding for it for bonds. So then the second step is to create the authorization to fund it, which is the bond order, which is the 3850 The third piece is to actually go out and bond. and. In some respects, we may not need to bond um, the full amount. Mm -hmm. and for example, the Eastern Trail, we're, we're asking for the authority to bond, which is the bond order. However, we are not prepared to bond it yet because we're still looking for funding. So our goal is to try and get as much funding in as possible. And then, you know, so maybe by next year, Hopefully next year, maybe not the year after, that we'll be able to come back to, you know, go through the funding and, and actually bond these. So the only the only differences, Sean, between the amount of bond order and the amount we intend to bond next month uh, is the Cummings Roads project and the Eastern Trail project. Uh, so we're yes, we're seeking authorization to bond these projects, but they're not included in this next bond issue. I suppose you could argue, well, come back to us next year with your next bond order. We bond twice a year, right? No, once a once. Oh, once a year. Um, so, so, um, so, so there's two pieces to that. So one is about the Eastern Trail, and by the way, I'm a 100% supportive of the Eastern Trail, but the Eastern Trail itself and the organization um, and the gap has not been filled, so they're really not even in a position to move forward yet. So why couldn't we wait a year and bond it later? Well, we are. We're not going to bond it now, but I mean, we could take it out of the bond oh, I'm looking order. At, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the adjusted bond order. You're looking, you know, you'd be looking at the amount to bond. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. So, right. So, we wouldn't bond okay. it right now. All right. Yeah. Sorry. I was looking at the wrong column. Okay. But following that logic, we could wait even on the bond authorization, remove it entirely from the bond order, and come back to you um, this time next year. What are the problems we have? Then, then the two bond balances is equal. Correct. Okay. That's what I was Okay. Um, the other issue with, with waiting is that um, just as we have some of these, the next grouping down here says prior municipal capital authorization. Mm -hmm. It um, Some of these are more than a year old and we're just getting, yeah. so it kind of muddies the water a little bit. If we can do the bond orders for the current year projects, then then we have them and we know what we need It to really do. reduces the need to come the backlog of projects, if you will. Mm -hmm. So so what what would happen for a situation? I'm sorry, yeah. yeah. So what will happen, in, let's say, in a situation this the, um, the senior recreation area? You haven't broken ground on that yet, right, I assume? No. Um, so if we choose to remove that, or or I don't want to say remove that, if we choose not to bond that this year, but push that bonding off one year, what does that do to the project? Are there penalties, or have we already got consultants, or is that, I mean, other than inconvenience, you're going to have some angry seniors. So that's the cost. <laughs> right. Raise their taxes and still angry. Them. Yeah. Either way, we're going to have angry seniors one way or another, right? So, I mean, I'm just saying as an example, if, I'm not saying that we're going to do right. something like that, but what, you know, is that, are there other unforeseen consequences for doing something like that? No, uh, that's a project where I'm not sure, is there a declaration of intent there? I believe there is. If so, I, I suppose we could fund it by cash and reimburse ourselves next year. So, so what's this declaration of intent? I mean, this is an internal project within ourselves. Either IRS or SEC, it's one of those 
acronyms that require us, in order for us to reimburse ourselves with bond proceeds, we have to declare it up front. So if we had come to you, I think we did this with the uh, fire truck, the letter truck, it was during an off mm -hmm. part because the, the vehicle needed to be replaced. And uh, so I had to do a separate declaration of intent that we were going to Fun. perhaps expend those funds ourselves and then reimburse ourselves. So, um, otherwise, by law, we can't reimburse ourselves. So we could spend all this money. If we don't have those in place for folks to take a look at, then technically we couldn't reimburse ourselves. So and we couldn't bond those funds. So we, we'd be essentially <coughs> paying it out of our general fund. So if your question is if that project for, for just for example, if if you wish to push, push it off a year, we would simply not do construction, not incur the expense until some point in the future. That's one option. Okay. Consequences, perhaps angry, un, you know, upset citizens. Uh, the other option would be for, for us not to include it uh, in secure uh, bond funding now, yet go ahead with the project, which would mean we'd need to find another interim source of finance, uh, such as cash on hand. Um, and that's not limitless, obviously. Um, and then reimburse ourselves with future bond proceeds. And then the ones that say, you know, we're reimbursing ourselves, we've already spent those funds. Or, or if it's work in progress, then there has been some expenditures already or contracts in place. I think it's because I need a cup of coffee, but um, so can you, I'm still not following this declaration piece. Um, because so in the plow truck and the loader, we've already spent our own cash, and now we're going to, and asking for financing to reimburse ourselves. When did we declare that we were going to bond it in order to spend it out of the cash to then reimburse ourselves? Last July. Essentially, after the budget's approved, I so go. So the budget through. approval is a declaration. No, mm -hmm. at, at June 30th, once the budget's been passed and approved in July, I'll go through the capital budget and anything that has to be on it. I go in, there's a form that the um, okay. bond council has yep. prepared for us and, and uh, I fill in the blanks essentially. I attach a copy okay. of the CIP budgets that say, you know, see the attached. These are the ones that we're including that we in anticipate that we might have to reimburse ourselves. I mean, we might not also because we might wait and actually use the proceeds of the bonds. Oh, I get it. Yeah. Sorry, I was a little slow. And it's really a timing issue. Uh, I can assure you right now, Mike Shaw has um, the specifications ready to go for the truck that you just talked about yeah. in his budget. And so typically that will hit the street um, 1st of July. And so we're awarding a contract late July and there's probably a six month lead time. So it, it's really, uh, it's a function of kind of the cycle of these, these sorts of things. You don't buy them off the lot. So, so what happens if we do not reimburse ourselves? That comes out of general fund. Fund balance. Correct. Fund balance. Okay. Thanks. And, and, you know, we could actually do the bond orders at the time we're doing the, the budget if you wanted to do that. I mean, we could do it as a separate. But it seems cumbersome. Would we want to, would, don't we get benefits from packaging all these together at one and one time? Uh, we could have a bond order that sits and we could go buy the bonds at a later date. Uh, we, right. we tend to do them back to back. Yeah. Okay. So other two. Yeah. So the second um, handout is to Councilor Bayline's question. I think your question was something to affect. Uh, you were looking at three years. We actually have shown ten here. Forgive us for that. Um, I guess the impact of this borrowing on debt service, and this assumes that four million dollars. So it's slightly higher than the amounts we we're just talking about. Um, but we're reflecting both uh, principal and interest and then a combined. So you'll note, uh, and, and this just takes into account that this $4 million borrowing, it doesn't consider additional borrowing in the out years beyond that. Uh, but you'll see the sort of effect it has on both principal and interest. Uh, combined, we will have reduced our debt load in that 10 year period even including this ten, this four million dollars, by nearly seventy-five million. But that's assuming no additional bonding moving forward, correct? Right. We could certainly create a model that does that. But we're trying to answer his question, his question of last night, which was, what is the effect of this borrowing? Uh, I think over the next three years. Mm -hmm. So you see, essentially, it would produce three hundred eighty thousand dollars in uh, principal expense, 
Is that right? Principal expense. Thirty-two. So three hundred eighty thousand is assuming that we had borrowed from four million dollars. Yeah, I get that. Okay. Yep. And uh, and an eighty ninety thousand dollar interest expense. So over ten ten years. Right. Well, over ten years, you, we'll have repaid two point eight million dollars in principal against that four million. Not in, and, but then an additional five hundred eighty-two thousand dollars in interest. Yes, against that four million dollar yes. borrowing. Yes. But we've folded that into the overall existing debt as well to see, to see so you can see how that works. If this were the amount we were actually going to bond and we were going to have the first payment in 2018, we would need to be adding roughly about $460,000 to the 2018 budget. Yes, I, yes, I get that. Yep, 400, well, 470, is that what you The 380,000. Plus 89. Right. Yep. Um, okay. So that will, yep. uh, the person, the, the financial advisor is the one who helps us yep. do the debt schedule. And uh, he was out today, so sure. I'm hoping I'll have those. So, Monday. if I could say something before we get into the kind of the legalese around the one particular project, um, and you know, I want to also uh, have a conversation with Peter just to kind of hear his um, take on this as well to have a full co committee. Um, other than a couple of very small issues within the bond order, I don't see the, at least where I was going with this, I don't see the impact of what I was looking for in the existing bond order that we're being asked to approve other than the issue around the DP piece. Um, however, I refocus the attention on future bond orders um, because those are future projects that have not been funded, they have not been declared, they have, nothing has been done that will impact that service and at least in the next couple of years where, where we're also going to be focusing our attention on because um, there's very little you can do based upon the transactional kind of nature of these um, and the state of those. Um, so I'm kind of redirecting my attention now to not this current bond question, it's really going to be about the new bonds that we're asked, being asked to because it impacts that service in the future. Because we're not going to, the, the uh, even if you take out you know, two or three that it might be pet projects that we don't have to start, you're talking about less than $300,000 in debt that, have, that haven't have been started that you know, have very, very little impact in the debt structure for debt service payments. Uh, yeah, I just I, I think looking at the bigger picture, yeah, that, that's if, we've got, if we've got to bridge a gap this year, we're not going to bridge it through the bonds. No, 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 is, no, 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 no. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that at all. But it's one mechanism of many that we have at our disposal yeah. to try and. I mean, if we, if we, you know, debt by a thousand cuts, right? I mean, if it's, it may not be the silver bullet that we're looking for, but if it's something and it can contribute to the yeah. to to the bottom line this year. I think we need to look at that. I'm not saying that we do it. I'm just saying it's it's got to. I think it's got to contribute to that conversation. You know what I mean? I, I mean, I know it's it's only. I mean, if we've got our shortfall this year of 2.4 or whatever it is, we, we or our gap or whatever it is, you know, uh, 300,000 could help, right? I think maybe maybe it's worth having the discussion. But yeah, I, I, I still wait for Peter to get back and and, uh, um, and and certainly take a look at this again. When 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 do we do we have a drop dead decision time for this? Schedule will come back to you second reading on May third. Okay. So, so by May third, we'll, we should. And, and he said uh, work begins May third or the first week of May. Oh. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, no. I'm thinking, I'm already jumped into. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah no, no. Yeah. Right. So we do, we don't take it. Make sure we put on the next. I think. Do we have finance? Next Thursday, so yeah. we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll talk to, to Peter and make sure this yeah. will be yeah. on your next agenda as well. Yeah. There's a time schedule set for this bond issue, so there we do have some. That's the, that's the restriction that we have running up against is the bond issuance requirement. Right. Kind of and and I do apologize. Normally we started this yeah. process in like the end of January, beginning of February. We actually didn't even start this until April, so we were we were kind of behind the eight ball. And you know, I held it back. Um, I just wanted to bring it forward the night I proposed the budget, and I thought there was enough on that agenda, so we lost two weeks in that regard as well. I don't foresee an issue. We should have to be able to do a budget. Oh, I agree. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 
So with respect to the one project, the fuel station replacement, which was the subject of conversation last evening, uh, and, and again, this is a conversation I think Councillor Hayes ought to be involved with as well. I, I have had an initial conversation with the town attorney, and I do expect to have uh, some guidance, uh, a letter or memo from him for your benefit. Um, essentially, if you look at the town charter, and that's the issue that we're kind of confronted with, uh, as I mentioned last night, but I, I did provide a copy of the relevant section of the charter, and that's section seven, uh, 907. And essentially that requirement, um, um, certain items require uh, voter approval. And the simple test is anything above 400,000 uh, requires voter approval. But the charter goes on to provide a number of exclusions, and I'll just take the time to read them. One, the refunding of any securities or other obligations does not require voter approval. Two, the issuance of GO securities or other direct or indirect obligations of the town for streets, sidewalks, or storm or sanitary sewers or other public utilities. And the third category is any construction or financing of improvements or equipment needed as a result of fire, flood, disaster, or other declared emergency. It goes on to say, in that same section, for purposes of this section, the town council may vote uh, by uh, five of its members to adopt emergency orders or resolves authorizing construction or financing of improvements or equipment needed as a result of uh, fire, <coughs> disaster, or other emergencies as such orders or resolves shall contain a section in which the emergency is set forth and defined, provided, however, that the declaration of such emergency by the town council shall be conclusive. Uh, interestingly, the uh, only other reference of emergency in the town charter is found in emergency ordinances, and it adopts the same language. Um, initial communication with the town attorney, uh, he did observe, and I think you'll see it in his guidance memo, um, had this section stopped um, at the end of or declared emergency, I think that would be quite confining to you, but it clearly contemplates in my interpretation that the council has its own ability to declare an emergency. Uh, it's not confined to an official declaration, which is actually a statutory reference that uh, that connotes um, uh, really special police powers and curfew laws and those sorts of things under a declared emergency. This seems to suggest a more local process defined by the council. And so I think if you wish, there is opportunity for you. And in this instance, I, I don't know if I would call it an emergency, but uh, it's not that much different than what I think the intent of this provision or exclusion is, we are under a uh, regulatory directive, a mandate, and are facing fines if we choose not to follow it. And so um, I think there are some parallels and similarities in that regard. And uh, should you wish to go down that road, that's an option you could pursue. And again, I've had the town attorney um, considering this and will be providing some legal guidance to you. I, should, I certainly will have it for next Thursday. So and I'm sorry, I don't, the legal lease for me. Um, so this was the declaration of such emergency by the town council shall be conclusive. What exactly does that mean? It means what we, once we decide it, it's the emergency. We can say it's it's Tuesday and that's an emergency because it's Tuesday, and then that's it. It's the emergency. But that's not. Okay. So, so to me, a conclusive statement is um, to meet regulatory uh, requirements, we must replace this. The, the current regulatory, I mean, there's going to have to be legal. Uh, yeah, I, I suspect. It has to be very specific. It can't be open ended so that you can continue the emergency and just keep spending oh, I see what you're and violate yeah, I, I, I suspect the town attorney will be advising that should you wish to make this declaration, um, you should provide rationale for that, yeah. uh, kind yeah. of a finding, if you will. Yeah. Uh, and it may be strong enough to make the finding on the fact that it's a regulatory mandate that we must comply with. Um, that's an option that uh, you can consider, and I'm pleased that you've preserved other options should you need or wish to go there, uh, which would which could include putting on the June ballot if that's the, the will of the council. So you've kept that option alive in front of you. 
Do we know what the uh, uh, penalty re penalties would be, what the fines would be if we... I don't, but I'll certainly research that and okay. be able to advise you. Okay. The well, other complicating factor, and I'll accept full responsibility, is we have uh, awarded contract to this work. Mm -hmm. Materials are have been manufactured. They're still at the manufacturer, but the work is due. It's a 60-day work period uh, due to commence in May. Um, What's the initial outlay for that? Well, we've outlaid next to nothing, but our vendor has undoubtedly committed funds uh, for materials that aren't in our, his or our possession, but manufacturers have built them to our specification. So there are contractual issues that I'm understanding and, and working with. There's typically cancellation clauses we have to pay for the work done to, to the point or work completed up to this point. So The good news, most of these uh, this equipment I don't believe is custom in that it arguably would have value to other okay. folks in other projects. Uh, but having said that, there are com contractual issues uh, I need to be aware of and respect. Okay. So I, for, again, I don't want to speak for anybody else, but for me, I, I'd like to see what those penalties and those requirements would be. Should we, should we not move this forward or should we move it forward to referendum and it doesn't pass? What the consequences to that would be? Yeah. I think the difficult part is determining what the uh, regulatory fines and penalties are going to be. Because one thing that I've We've learned, even though in a very different environment, is that depending upon how agrarious the, the situation is, I'm sure the fines will be significantly higher than the proposed fines <coughs> for violating um, the, you know, that whole issue around docks on the beach and the piping sure. covers. We were fined pretty high, pretty being threatened with a fine that was pretty high and kind of outrageous, and they're, and they're willing to expend the money. And so, something of this nature, where you have a uh, you know, an expired oil tank that is dangerous to the environment. You're talking, I've seen this as far as, you know, banking for uh, different commercial transactions. You're talking a lot of money, and the longer it goes out, the fines get bigger, the penalties get higher. Yeah. So, um, I, and I'm just looking for a point of order of magnitude. Yeah. I'm not looking for a fine that, you know, it's a $30,000 fine, and we'll calculate that in over five years or whatever until we get it done. I, I just, I'm looking for an order of magnitude. We don't. I, I, I will certainly be able to yeah. quote your range. Uh, we're not in any kind of yep. notice violation or any kind of area where that regulatory authority has told us what the fine is, but I can certainly give you the bookends of what that could be. That, that's fine for me. And then doesn't federal law supersede state law, which would supersede local law? That's why I we have lawyers. No, <laughs> Process well, of that would be. Yeah. Yes, but uh, it depends on uh, interpretation. Right. I, I will state for, state for the record, I believe that the council should declare an emergency and we fund this uh, for a bond. It is mandated by federal law that we need to replace an underground oil tank. It's a, it's a, it's a declared emergency. Yeah, I think you, will, you made comments to this effect last night. This uh, underscores or reminds me of some inconsistencies or some improvements that really need to be considered. Uh, this is not something, not that I don't respect the voters' opinion and when appropriate we should get their opinion, <coughs> but there are certain circumstances that um, I, I couldn't expect the voters to understand the sort of financial penalties that we may face uh, or the environmental hazards that might come from non-compliance. The thing about this, so the penalties exceed $400,000, we'll have to go to our referendum to get their approval to pay those, right? Well, no, no. Yeah. Because, I mean, again, I think it's a question of whether it's discretionary spending or whether it's obligatory spending, right? And I think that's kind of where we're at right now. It's not like if we could choose to put this off, we would put it off, or it's we're driving the schedule for this. It sounds like we're being mandated, we're being directed to do this, um, you know, uh, because that's why I want to see what the consequences are. If mm -hmm. you choose to make the decision to put this out to referendum and it fails, what does that do to the impact? Of, what, how does it impact the town? I mean, there are other options that you could consider. You could appropriate the money and thereby not need voter approval. Okay. This is limited to indebtedness only. Mm -hmm. uh, the other option is to uh, do it in multiple pieces, which um, I, I would not recommend. Uh, under the threshold, so th there are other options, but I think those w could be viewed and frankly are a direct evasion of those requirements. Um, so I'm glad that you have a number of options still preserved at this point. So I'll have that for you and report uh, next Thursday. And they'll need the they'll need something for Tony if it's going to go into the referendum. Right? She'll need something. Yeah, and we'll have time if we bring it up next week too. 
Uh, item number six is uh, future meeting dates. I'm not going to run through all of them. I'll just mention that next Wednesday is the budget forum. It is uh, April 26th at 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. at the uh, Wentworth School. And then also Thursday the 27th at, from 6 to 8 p.m. we'll be meeting back here to cover uh, community services and administration. And I would just like to add tomorrow at 3.30 we have the joint finance committee. Oh, I apologize. That's right. 3.30. Um, with that, um, item number seven is any public comments. Anybody would like to get up and speak? Not seeing any. Um, motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? And we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, guys.